dear researchers, uh, colleagues, dear researchers, colleagues, participants, friends, welcome to the day two of Creating Conference 2022. Yeah. We are very thankful that you're here with us and we are very excited about today's program. Our speakers are going to share their knowledge on creatine supplementation in rehabilitation, women's health, older adults, diabetes and glucose management, and brain health. Uh, all uh, presentations are being recorded and will be put online and we will provide you more information. These are very exciting topics for today and these are gonna be good, um, huge opportunity to learn from world's greatest experts on creatine. We also are exciting to organize the panel session uh, at the end of today, and we would like to ask you to share your questions with us. But for now, please enjoy the conference, and let me introduce our first guest, who's Dr. Kylie Harmon from University of Central Florida. All right, can you see my screen? All right, here's hoping. Um, so my name is Kylie Harmon. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Central Florida, um, where I work in the neuromuscular plasticity lab. And today I'm gonna talk to you about our review paper on the application of creatine supplementation in medical rehabilitation. So before I dive into the content of my talk today, I just wanna say thank you um, to the organizers of this conference. A lot of work has really gone on behind the scenes to make this a wonderful conference for all of you in attendance. Um, I also wanna thank all of you that are here listening to us speak and listening to all this exciting work on creatine and hopefully furthering this work afterwards. Um, it's very important for me to thank the research teams who wor whose work we included in this review. Um, review papers can't happen without all of the original research kind of being done on the front lines to further this, uh, the creatine supplementation work around the world. So we really appreciate all of the work that these investigators are doing. And then, of course, my co-authors on this paper, uh, Drs. Jeff Stout, David Bakuda, Patrick Pabian, Eric Rossin, and Matt Stock. Um, none of this would have gotten done without them. It was a team effort from start to finish. So I just want to thank them for their input and their guidance on this. Okay, so to give you a bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today, um, there are a variety of different pathologies um, and disease states that may be affected positively by creatine supplementation. Um, so from things kind of as simple as immobilization protocols to more chronic diseases and illnesses like Parkinson's disease or MS, um, there's a lot of rationale for creatine supplementation and why it might be beneficial for these patient populations. Um, but that said, um, we kind of took looked at all of the literature on these different disease states and pathologies and synthesized this information for you. So the take home message is really going to be um, which pathologies does creatine supplementation appear to be very effective for, which is it possibly effective for, um, and which is it not likely effective for. Um, I'll say this again throughout, but I just want to give the caveat that with a lot of these disease states where we're seeing that creatine supplementation is maybe not likely effective or possibly effective, um, more work really needs to be done here. Um, some of the not likely effective diseases, we only had uh, two or three studies that we could find in the literature, so it's hard to draw definitive conclusions that, you know, creatine doesn't work in these populations. So I'm just going to present what we found in the literature and then um, if you're interested in this, you really should take it and look further into it on your own. All right, um, so creatine's role in medical rehabilitation. Well, there are numerous disease conditions which result in physical dysfunction, um, impaired movement, strength loss, muscle atrophy, um, and all of these can really affect the body's physiological systems. Um, the musculoskeletal system, the pulmonary system, nervous system, just to name a few. Um, and in these conditions where muscle mass and strength and physical function are detrimentally impacted, 
it's really important that we try to focus on interventions to regain physical losses um, and prevent any further physical losses so that we can have good function in these populations. Um, it's even been suggested by some researcher research groups that creatine supplementation might be really beneficial in conjunction with conventional physical therapy, which I think is probably not surprising given what we have heard about creatine and learned about it over the last day and will continue to learn today. But due to creatine's anabolic potential and the really well-documented effects that it has on skeletal muscle and performance in healthy populations, can creatine be used as an effective rehabilitative aid in these pathologies that affect various physiological systems of the body? So that's what we set out to determine here for you. So there are several anecdotal reports in the media that you may have seen over the years that creatine can exacerbate muscle dysfunction, um, cause cramping and injuries, maybe even rhabdomyolysis. Um, but this is really not supported by the literature. Um, and creatine has actually been investigated as a means of enhancing recovery and reducing exercise-induced muscle damage. Uh, so the current state of the science really indicates that creatine aids in um, improving several markers of exercise-induced muscle damage, such as reduced levels of muscle serum proteins, uh, creatine kinase, lactase dehydrogenase, reduced inflammatory compounds like prostaglandins, TNF-alpha, interferon-alpha, uh, reduced oxidative stress markers, increased recovery of strength, and reduced delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, I don't have this on the slide, but additionally, it's been shown to result in increased growth factor expression, satellite cell number, and myonuclei concentration. Um, so collectively, these data really indicate that creatine is not only a performance-enhancing nutrient, which we know, but really an adaptive nutrient, which augments the adaptive response to training. So can we capitalize on this for rehabilitative purposes? Of course, um, when looking at recovery from muscle damage, there's you know, not consistent improvements found across all studies or variables, but this really has to do with the high heterogeneity in these studies that we've looked at. So differences in creatine dosage, timeline of the interventions, the interventions themselves, the protocols being used. But ultimately we can draw two important conclusions as far as creatine's effects on muscle damage. And that is that several studies have shown protective effects of creatine on exercise-induced muscle damage. So this requires more exploration um, as far as the population, the dosage, the timeline, all of those things. Um, and despite the myths and the anecdotal reports in the media, there really is no data to support that creatine increases muscle damage following intense exercise. So even though I have students in my classes come up to me and say that their parents say creatine is bad and creatine is a steroid, that is absolutely not the case. And as I think we've learned over the last few days, pretty much everyone can benefit from this in some way or another. So as far as recovery from exercise, the rationale for creatine supplementation is good and it is very likely effective. So a, a model that's been used a lot in the literature to assess the effects of creatine is immobilization and disuse-induced atrophy. So even short periods of disuse can cause a whole host of decrements, such as decrements in muscle size and strength, increased muscle protein breakdown, um, an altered neuromuscular function, just to name a very few. This is the tip of the iceberg. We could have another whole conference on how immobilization and disuse-induced atrophy are problematic. Um, but the decrements that occur during disuse can lead to greater problems down the road as well, such as longer recovery periods, greater chance of injury recurrence, and a decline in overall metabolic health. So ultimately, we really want to try to prevent these things from occurring to such an extent uh, during periods of immobilization and disuse, even when they're prescribed and necessary. Um, and it's very exciting that creatine supplementation during immobilization has shown promise in the literature. Um, a study by Johnston et al. observed that the effects of creatine supplementation on the preservation of muscle mass, muscle strength, and endurance during a seven-day immobilization period of the upper limb um, was actually beneficial compared to an isocaloric placebo. Uh, creatine during the immobilization better maintained muscle mass, strength, and muscular endurance of the elbow flexors and extensors in this particular study since it was in the upper limb. Um, and this was done in creatine-naive men as well, so men that had not previously supplemented with creatine. 
A similar study observed uh, the, the impact of creatine supplementation during two weeks of cast immobilization of the lower limb. And although they didn't see many results in terms of um, strength or size, they did see that creatine supplementation offset the observed decreases in GLUT4 protein content throughout immobilization. So this indicated that creatine likely promotes favorable glucoregulation. Um, GLUT4 also increased significantly with creatine supplementation during the subsequent 10-week rehabilitation program. Um, this is exciting because if you get into the immobilization and disuse literature, there are some, some negative effects of glucoregulation that can occur when we're not using our muscles. So if creatine can possibly offset that, that could be very exciting for certain disease populations. And then the beneficial effects of creatine supplementation have also been observed in animal models, of course, um, specifically in periods of hind limb suspension in rodents. Um, if you have worked with rat or mice models much, you know that it's very difficult to put their tiny little legs in a cast. So hind limb suspension is used instead, whereby the tail is kind of lifted. And so the hind limbs are not making contact with the ground. It, it acts as an unloading model. But in this work by Aoki, when uh, rodents were given creatine enhanced food before and during a period of seven days of hind limb suspension, uh, the creatine supplementation did appear to mitigate muscle loss. Um, this is an intriguing finding as it might indicate that people who are already taking creatine, who are taking creatine habitually, may have better outcomes in immobilization and, in, and disuse induced atrophy um, than those who aren't taking it regularly. A lot, we can't necessarily plan for this if we're gonna have an injury and need to be in a cast, but um, if we're already taking creatine, it's possible that we'll see better results than those who aren't as far as rehab is concerned. And of course, there are some conflicting results in the literature on this topic, as they're all with all things that we research. Um, and several studies have shown that there's no effect of creatine supplementation on the maintenance of upper body work and power, quadriceps, cross-sectional area, and strength, depending on the study that you look at. Um, however, a study by Hespel et al. Um, looked at creatine supplementation. And despite the fact that creatine did not effectively preserve size or strength during a period of immobilization, it did result in quicker recovery of these parameters during subsequent rehabilitation. Um, so that's exciting as rehab is an important part of immobilization. Um, and it is important to note, again, I'll mention this a lot, I can't help it, but with all these conflicting results, there are huge differences in protocols and timeline and duration and dosing, muscles involved, population. So that's all going to affect the overall outcome. But ultimately, despite some conflicting results here, the current state of the science really seems to indicate that creatine likely confers a protective effect on skeletal muscle during periods of immobilization. So going back to our graphic here for immobilization, creatine supplementation is possibly effective. Getting into some post-operative orthopedic recovery research, um, given the promising results observed during controlled immobilization studies in healthy populations, there has been some interest as to whether creatine might be useful as a rehabilitative aid during post-operative orthopedic recovery. Um, however, unfortunately, at the time that we published this article, there really hadn't been a lot of work done on this topic. Um, and so far, it doesn't really appear that there is an observable beneficial effect for uh, recovery from orthopedic surgery. Work by Tyler et al. observed no impact on functional recovery from ACL surgery, and work by Roy et al. observed no improvement in functional recovery after total knee arthroplasty. Um, but this area really needs to be explored further. It's hard to draw definite conclusions with a limited number of studies examining different operative interventions. Yes, we're looking at the knee in both situations here, but even without knowing the details of the study demographics, when you think of those who are undergoing ACL surgery, you typically think of you know, athletes, younger populations, and those undergoing TKA, total knee replacements, typically older adults, maybe some other issues going on there. Um, so it's hard to draw this definite conclusion from just these two, two pieces of literature. So for post-operative orthopedic recovery, at the moment, it appears that creatine supplementation is not likely effective, but again, this really needs to be explored further. As similar to immobilization and orthopedic surgery, muscle and nerve damage can of course result in a host of um, decrements such as muscle atrophy, 
um, impaired function and mobility, and then further inactivity, which kind of exacerbates all of these things. Um, so far, this work has really only been done in animal models, um, but it appears that creatine supplementation may be effective in recovery from nerve damage, at least. Um, so in rats who had their sciatic nerve surgically severed, the addition of a creatine enhanced diet significantly improved their functional recovery and re of the muscle, which is exciting. Um, but this doesn't seem to be the case when looking at recovery from muscle damage. Um, after injecting rat soleus with a toxin to cause muscle damage, a uh, creatine enhanced diet had no effect on regeneration of muscle mass or recovery. So for our graph here, for a, different types of acute injury, it appears that creatine supplementation is possibly effective. So in individuals with spinal cord injury, they're often dealing with a lot of things other than just the injury itself. So extreme deconditioning, strength impairments, diminished work capacity. Um, and then again, as with other pathologies that we've seen, this leads to further inactivity and exacerbation of these problems. Um, so they really need interventions to help improve some of the, the outcomes that they're seeing. Um, so given what we know about creatine and its effect on muscle strength and work capacity, it has been examined in these patient populations as a means of enhancing their physical function. So several studies in patients with cervical level spinal cord injury in particular have shown that supplementing with creatine leads to enhanced work capacity, increased cardiorespiratory fitness. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Kylie, but... We are not uh, seeing your slides. No. Um, I'm not sure maybe you stopped sharing. If you could please check that. Sure. Are maybe you seeing my screen now? Try to stop it. Uh, yeah, it's working now. It's working Thank now. Thank you very okay. much. No, I'm so sorry. Um, where where did you stop seeing them? Should I go back a few slides? Uh, yeah, if you can maybe go back a little bit, we'll, we'll tell you. Sure, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Further than immobilization? Uh, the next one, please. The next Further? one. This one. Okay, cool. So we covered immobilization. Okay, cool. Fantastic. Okay. Cool. Picking up where we left off. Okay, so Thank sorry, you so you're much. gonna hear. No, 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 that's fine. Um, I, I won't go into as much detail maybe as I just did, but just so you can see these slides, um, that there there really is no impact of creatine supplementation currently observed in the literature as far as post-operative orthopedic recovery is concerned. Um, but again, more work really needs to be done there. Um, acute injury we talked about. Yeah, so for acute injury, creatine supplementation is possibly effective. Okay, so spinal cord injury, I think, is where, is where we kind of were. Um, yeah, so individuals with spinal cord injury do often suffer from these other effects, extreme deconditioning, muscle strength impairments. Um, but creatine supplementation has shown promise in these patients. Um, patients with cervical level spinal cord injury have shown enhanced work capacity, um, increased cardiorespiratory fitness, uh, VO2 max, VCO2, ventilatory threshold, and increased upper body strength and arm cross-sectional area, which can be very important if these patients need to pro propel themselves with a wheelchair. Increased upper body strength is going to be extremely beneficial. Um, this has also been observed in animal models, rats in particular. Um, rats with a surgical spinal cord injury, a surgically induced spinal cord injury, excuse me, were fed a creatine enhanced diet for four weeks prior to their surgical injury. And they, at the end of the study, the creatine enhanced diet significantly improved their locomotor capacity. Um, and they also observed reduced effects of secondary neurotrauma in the rats that were given creatine as measured by um, lesion, uh, the scar tissue in the lesion site, excuse me. So for spinal cord injury, it appears that creatine supplementation is likely effective. All right, 
Um, creatine supplementation may also confer a beneficial effect on physical function in those with various arthritic diseases. Over the course of a 12-week resistance training program in postmenopausal women with knee osteoarthritis, creatine supplementation improved their physical function and lower, lean, lower limb lean mass, excuse me, significantly. Um, similarly, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, uh, creatine supplementation improved muscle strength over a three-week period. And this was despite the fact that there was no associated training program. Um, however, in this study with rheumatoid arthritis patients, the functional ability and disease activity did not change. So it led the authors to conclude that there was really no clear benefit of creatine supplementation. Um, but given the changes that were observed in muscle strength, it's possible that functional ability and disease activity would have improved as well if the um, intervention was extended out beyond the three-week period. So for arthritic diseases, creatine supplementation appears to be likely effective. Again, more work needs to be done here though, as we only had those two studies, but still very promising results. All right, so creatine has been of significant interest in patient with muscular dystrophies um, as these patients have pathologies that directly affect their creatine. Um, so they have significantly reduced skeletal muscle free creatine and phosphocreatine stores, as well as lower creatine transporter content, which then results in impaired creatine uptake and kinetics. So a variety of studies have examined the impact of creatine supplementation in patients with both Becker's and Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and have observed notable improvements in muscle strength, um, increased time to exhaustion and performance, prevention of joint stiffness and rigidity, which is a problem in these patients, improvements in grip strength and fat-free mass, as well as improvements in various functional tasks. And these are very exciting findings uh, but perhaps even more significantly are two other important benefits of creatine in these patient populations. Um, and that's that creatine was linked to improvements in self-reported activities of daily living skills and a subjective improvement in function. Uh, maximizing quality of life in this patient population is really incredibly important. So these subjective measures are very noteworthy, even when they're not directly accompanied by objective improvements in function or strength. Um, and there's also been some evidence that creatine may improve bone density in dystrophic children, which is significant. Um, very importantly in this work, there has been no adverse effects reported for creatine supplementation. Um, and most of this work has been done in adolescents or young children. So the fact that they are tolerating creatine well, their parents are on board with it, parents report better outcomes, um, again, a little subjective, but they feel that their children are doing better on creatine when they have muscular dystrophy. So that's it's very exciting um, and really a, a good potential um, addition to treatment plans for patients with muscular dystrophy. But before we move on from muscular dystrophy entirely, of course, there are some conflicting results here, particularly in the area of myotonic dystrophies. So despite the positive effects of creatine supplementation in patients with Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this really hasn't been observed in patients with type 1 myotonic dystrophy or type 2 myotonic dystrophy and proximal myotonic myopathy. It also really hasn't been looked at in patients with Fukuyama muscular dystrophy. So even though we're seeing some exciting things in Becker and Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, these findings might not be able to be directly extrapolated to other types of dystrophies. Um, so again, needs further exploration. But overall, the find and really could potentially maximize quality of life for these patient populations. So as far as muscular dystrophy is concerned, the rationale for creatine supplementation is strong and very likely effective. All right, uh, for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS patients, um, these patients are suffering from a neurodegenerative disease, excuse me, uh, which results in progressive loss of motor neurons that control their voluntary muscle activity. And so individuals with ALS uh, typically suffer, suffer from muscle weakness, uh, muscle atrophy, and a variety of other debilitating symptoms. Um, there is no cure for ALS and it's always fatal. So it's really important to try to minimize pain and discomfort and maximize function throughout the lifespan for those diagnosed with it. 
Um, it's been hypothesized that creatine supplementation may protect against several key aspects of ALS, such as that neuron loss that we talked about, um, as well as oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, but unfortunately, so far, there's been no observed benefit of creatine supplementation in this patient population. Um, it should be noted again, though, that this hasn't been widely studied yet, and only three trials were included in this review. All three of these also measured muscle strength as an outcome variable, which of course is very All right. Dr. Kylie, uh, I apologize, but you got muted. Can you please unmute? Yes, I'm so sorry. I was told the host muted me. I don't know if that was my fault or not. Good. Thank you. It's working now. Thank you so much. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, some technical difficulties to start off the day. I'm working out all the kinks now. Um, all right, let's see. Where was I? Yeah, so, so unfortunately, there really is no benefit in this patient population um, that's been observed so far, but uh, this was only really done in um, three studies that we examined, and all of these studies looked at muscle strength as an outcome measure, which is, of course, very important, um, but there are a lot of other things that might be going on here beyond muscle strength where creatine could be beneficial, uh, creatine and brain health. We've talked about, I'm sure we'll talk about more, um, so it's possible that that this just needs to be examined further. Um, also important to note that in the work that we included here, um, all of these patients were late in the disease process. So it remains to be seen whether the outcomes for patients with ALS and creatine supplementation would be improved um, if the, these interventions were occurring earlier on after diagnosis or earlier in the disease process. But currently, based on this work, it appears that creatine supplementation for ALS is not likely effective. All right, so for patients with multiple, multiple sclerosis, or MS, excuse me, uh, the hallmark characteristic of this is really a destruction or failure of the myelin-producing cells, which then results in impaired nerve transmission for these patients. So symptoms can vary greatly and widely, but they typically include weakness, uh, difficulty with balance and vision, and overall fatigue. So patients with MS actually present with a host of problems affecting their creatine systems, um, such as uh, compromised brain creatine metabolism, reduced cardiac phosphocreatine metabolism, and elevated levels of creatine kinase in the cerebrospinal fluid. So it would indicate that supplementing creatine might be extremely beneficial for this patient population. However, only two studies um, really have examined this, and there were no improvements uh, noted above the placebo in, in these works that we looked at in knee extension flexion work, muscle creatine stores, or knee joint power. Uh, but it's possible if other parameters were examined um, and more work was done, we might see more, more promising results. Because given what MS is, it does appear that creatine could be extremely beneficial in this patient population. But for now, it appears that there is, there's not a, a strong effect of creatine supplementation for MS patients. All right, uh, in patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, they're experiencing a progressive neurodegenerative disease. Um, it's characterized by resting tremors, rigidity, and problems with their gait and balance and walking. Um, so while the disease itself is not fatal, novel interventions to help manage the symptoms and comfort and improve quality of life are drastically needed. So in this review, we examined five different studies which supplemented creatine in these patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, and in, this work, in these works, it's really important to note that the two most common outcome measures used are the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which measures mental, motor, and activities of daily living, and the Schwab and England scale, which measures something a little different, difficulty completing daily chores and activities. Um, so there is some discrepancy in the literature regarding these scales, as there has been some between group changes observed in the Schwab and England scale, but not in the unified Parkinson's disease rating scale. 
Um, but ultimately, it does appear that the impact of creatine supplementation in Parkinson's disease patients may be small. Um, we're not seeing huge effects here. So for Parkinson's disease, it appears that creatine supplementation is, is not likely effective at this time, given the li current literature. All right, so Charcot-Marie tooth disease or CMT disease is a group of motor and sensory neuropathies that cause muscle weakness and atrophy in the hands and feet. Um, it's slowly progressive and incurable. And although it's not fatal, it can cause declines in strength and physical activity, overall physical function, um, and difficulty with walking and gait due to the foot drop that's experienced in these patients. Um, only three studies have really evaluated the effects of creatine supplementation in CMT patients with mixed results. Um, creatine has been observed to have no impact on activities of daily living, body mass, percent fat mass, or fat-free mass, um, even when combined with resistance training in the, one of these uh, studies that we looked at. But it is possible that the very large effects of resistance training in novices, um, which this group was, may have kind of dampened any observable effect of creatine if they're seeing such extreme um, changes due to the, the new training stimulus. It's possible that the effect of creatine is just not as measurable in these two groups. Um, but it's not all bad news as secondary analysis of these findings did indicate that creatine supplementation increased type 2 myosin heavy chain content in this patient population, um, which kind of provides a possible role of creatine for altering skeletal muscle synthesis in, in these patients. And in this secondary analysis, um, these findings were also correlated with an increase in chair rise performance, which can be very beneficial when a decline in strength and physical function is at play. So for CMT disease, creatine supplementation is possibly effective. So creatine plays a very large role in both cardiac function and vascular health. Um, and it has been explored as a possible um, therapy and rehabilitation from COPD and heart failure. Um, there is some evidence in the literature to support performance benefits in this population with um, observations of increased strength, muscular strength and endurance, aerobic power, and improved body composition. Um, but for this study, or this review, excuse me, um, we were really more interested in the addition of creatine for rehabilitation. So we looked at cardiac rehab and cardiopulmonary rehab, and not just how creatine played a role in these patients. So when looking at periods of rehab, um, the addition of creatine supplementation seems to result in only minimal improvements. But as we just spoke about with CMT disease, this may be due to the robust stimulus of consistent exercise in this patient population. Um, cardiopulmonary rehab typically consists of two to three 30 to 90 minute exercise sessions weekly. Um, so when you're seeing these kind of robust interventions, it's possible that you know everyone is just benefiting from this regardless of the creatine or not. Um, but despite this, other groups have, deserved, have observed, excuse me, a positive effect of creatine supplementation on COPD patients during pulmonary rehab um, with creatine resulting in increases in fat-free mass, muscular strength and endurance, and health status. Um, another perspective by Hamadi et al. observed improvements in markers of inflammation in heart failure patients, specifically interleukin-6 in C-reactive protein, and also, I believe, endothelial function. Um, so there is some promising results there for patients undergoing cardiopulmonary rehab. As you can see, for COPD and heart failure, uh, creatine supplementation is possibly effective. And then finally, getting into mitochondrial cytopathies. Um, these are a group of genetic disorders that adversely affect the electron transport chain. Um, this results in an inability of the different physiological systems of the body, such as the nervous system, cardiac system, endocrine system, and musculoskeletal systems to meet their energy needs. They're not able to meet their energy needs. So due to this, patients with this group of disorder typically have very poor exercise tolerance, um, reduced cardiorespiratory fitness, uh, muscle weakness, and decreased phosphocreatine concentrations. Um, so there are two primary variants that we looked at um, in this paper, the molasse variant mitochondrial cytopathy or mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes, and the CPEO variant or chronic progressive external ophthalmology. Ophthalmologia, excuse me, it's a mouthful. 
Um, and interestingly, the benefit of creatine supplementation appears to differ in these two varieties of mitochondrial cytopathy patients. Um, creatine has been shown to have positive effects in the molass variant patients, such as improvements in dorsiflexion, strength and endurance, and improvements in hand grip strength. Um, but however, this has not been observed in the CPEO variant patients, uh, measured by exercise performance and activities of daily living in this particular uh, study. But the authors postulate that this may be due to the fact that the CPEO variant patients don't typically present with creatine and phosphocreatine concentrations um, compromised to the extent that molass variant patients do. So they may have a different magnitude of responses to creatine supplementation. But given the conflicting results and the amount of work that's been done, um, this really needs to be explored further. So for mitochondrial cytopathies, it appears that creatine supplementation is possibly effective depending on the variety. So as you can see, as we went throughout this, and if you read the paper, um, there are a lot of discrepant findings here. Some of the findings are very promising um, and some are kind of conflicting. And the reason for this, which I didn't go into too much detail um, on due to time constraints, is that there's large differences in how these studies are done. So there's differences in the protocols specifically. There's differences in, in the durations of the creatine supplementation. Um, are, are these patients undergoing you know, several days, weeks, or months of protocols? Um, what is the dosing? Is there a loading phase? Um, the dosing kind of varies throughout these studies. Some studies looked at three grams of creatine, some looked at five, some looked at 10, some looked at 20, um, which is all included in our, in our review paper if you're interested in the specific loading doses. But of course, that's going to affect our outcomes. And then the patient populations as well. Are we looking at healthy individuals who are now undergoing periods of immobilization purely for scientific discovery? Or are we looking at disease states where there's other things going on? Um, you know, it's not just about muscle strength or performance. There's a lot going on physiologically with the body that might affect our outcomes. And then what stage of the disease are we in? Like we mentioned with the ALS research, all of these things are being done in later stages of the, stages of the disease. Um, are they gonna look different than if we were examining creatine supplementation earlier on after diagnosis? And then the overall timeline as well. Um, for periods of immobilization, is anabolic resistance at play? And again, if you get into the immobilization literature, um, there are some changes that occur in the muscle and with our hormones that affects muscle protein synthesis and breakdown. Um, are, are results going to vary based on periods of anabolic resistance with different disease states, maybe affecting our overall outcomes? So it's, it's hard to draw distinct conclusions from some of these uh, papers included in the review, particularly when there is not a lot of work done on some of these disease states and when there's differences in these protocols. Um, I think it's important to note, as I have a few times now, that for the diseases and pathologies where creatine does not appear to be effective, I would like to say that creatine does not appear to be effective yet. Um, more just might need to be done here. I think for a lot of these um, diseases, creatine really does hold promise and can be very effective if more work is done. But ultimately, kind of the take home messages here, uh, my co-authors and I drew up kind of the final conclusions from, the, from this review paper and all the papers that we looked at. Um, and that is that creatine supplementation may support recovery from exercise, it may promote maintenance of muscle mass, strength, and endurance during periods of immobilization and disuse. It may enhance recovery after nerve damage. It may improve physical function, lean mass, and strength in uh, arthritic populations. It may improve work capacity, strength, and lean mass in patients with spinal cord injury. It may improve physical function, lean mass, strength, bone density, and quality of life in patients with muscular dystrophies. This was really a big one and an important one. Um, it may be beneficial for patients with CMT via alterations in the type 2 myosin heavy chain content. It may improve lean mass, strength, and endurance, um, as well as health status in patients with COPD. And it may improve markers of inflammation in patients with heart failure. Um, finally, it may improve strength and endurance in molass variant mitochondrial cytopathy patients. Those are kind of our take-home messages from this paper. Um, a lot of promising work has been done in this, and it's exciting to um, see that research groups are exploring creatine supplementation as an additional therapy to medical rehabilitation. So our references, there are many. 
Thank you so much for your attention. I apologize that we had some technical difficulties there. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be at the panel later today and I can also be reached at kylie.harman at ucf.edu. Thank you.